Hello and welcome to this episode of The Sit Down. Today, uh, we're very lucky. It's taken a very long time for us to, to arrange this interview uh, with all the restrictions and everything ongoing. Today, we are joined by Peter Tristan, who was an international cocaine trafficker and spent years behind bars in some of the world's most dangerous prisons. Peter, welcome to this episode of The Sit Down. Hi, Michael. Thanks for having me on. How are you? My pleasure. Very good. Thank you. Very good. So researching your story has been a whirlwind of heartbeating learnings for me where you know just trying to find out and figure out what it would be like to 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 live in that world is is impossible without speaking to somebody like yourself so thank you for for coming to share your story i guess we should start at the beginning um what was it that got you or interested you in getting into drugs trafficking uh, in the first place what can you talk to me about that story of your first experience involving drugs um, yeah i mean i first became involved with drugs at, i mean at a young age uh with, with cannabis i think as most people first start with um uh mainly through i suppose through school friends i had two older stepbrothers who were quite heavily involved in the illegal rave scene back in the well towards the end of the 80s early 90s but it would have been towards the end of the 80s, actually. And um, started just dabbling with uh, trying cannabis at school and with a couple of schoolmates. And then uh, ended up, uh, well, started experimenting with things like uh, amphetamine and ecstasy at quite a young age of about 14. Um, and then started going along to the free parties, the illegal raves, tagging along with my stepbrothers and whatnot and found that it was very easy to deal drugs at these parties because there was no real police influence. They would just let you get on with it back then. So to, in order to offset the cost of partying, um, I started dealing drugs at you know, the weekend and then to school friends. Um, and yeah, so I suppose that was the first, first dabbling, so first uh, time. So you, so you started dealing XT. So you're obviously, <coughs> did you it just was find more, more cannabis, uh, you know, to schoolmates and whatnot? But um, I mean, the ecstasy and amphetamines that was mainly at the weekends because of the parties. Okay, and how how did you when when did you decide and and how did you figure out to um, bring uh, drugs into the UK and and what was your know. first trafficking experience like? <coughs> Excuse me, I'm just recovering from a yeah, chest infection. That um, the first sort of international trafficking that that came some time later. Um, the the first one that I did was when I was at uh, uni. I uh, went to university in Cardiff, studied archaeology, and um, yeah, brought. I'm not gonna say what, uh, but brought. Well, yeah, I brought some ecstasy into the country. Um, very nearly got caught. Uh, got stopped at customs in Dover, uh, drove over to Holland, came back in a car, and um, the guys that had given me the, the pills had, um, you, you remember the old flying jackets, the bomber jackets? The, yeah, yeah. The Alpha Industries ones, I think they were called. <laughs> These guys had just opened up the um, the, the lining of the, of the jacket and put a couple of thousand pills into the, poured them in, told me that they were the, that they were in their vacuum packed and all nicely packed up and whatnot and you know I wouldn't have any problem and um, so I drove back down through Belgium and through France and then on to uh, Calais got the ferry to Dover got stopped in Dover by customs and excise and they absolutely tore the car apart that I was sat in or well, that, I, that I was driving sorry and um, luckily didn't didn't come across well they got all of my luggage out and me ripped the car apart in front of me and i thought you know when they when they finished doing that they, they one of them came over to me and i thought oh here we go they're going to do a strip search on me yeah and i got I had a jacket literally i was well i was wearing it at that point and um and he came over and uh, he said there's your passport you're free to go and i couldn't believe it they didn't search my luggage or me I think they thought, I, I think they must have run a dog up and down the cars on the ferry, detected a scent, thought there were drugs in the car, and so ripped the car apart. Wow. Because I said, be calm and collected. 
uh, I got through that, and that was that was a really big adrenaline rush. I remember that, and I, I wasn't really taking ecstasy myself. So I was actually hype about three or four days afterwards on the on the adrenaline rush, and I think that was what got me addicted to, to some extent to to trafficking, shall we say? So you so yeah, because I was actually thinking there was there going to be a circumstance where maybe your uh, experience of that would be scary, thinking I'm going to get caught, I'm going to go to jail, but you actually oh, yeah. every, every second that they were ripping the car apart, I was sat there thinking because it was just before Christmas as well. I mean, like a week or two before, I had loads of Christmas presents in the car for my family, and I was thinking <laughs> I'm not going to get to share them with them. Um, yeah. But luckily, uh, it was all right. But I mean, it, to be honest, it, that did scare me a bit, and I didn't, I didn't go back to Holland after that. And I was later told by my friend that I'd done it with, who was contacted, was that the people that had um, loaded the pills into the jacket had actually tried to get me arrested. The plan was that I was going to get uh, arrested at Dover, and luckily I managed to get through. So that must have wow. been some fun on my on my part. So you, so you actually kind of got slightly addicted to the rush of getting away with it then, really? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, so you, you, you've brought the pills back over. You're obviously, you know, distributing, selling and making money. You in the UK actually started to make some serious amounts of money as this grew and developed, didn't you? How, how much, you know, at the peak, how much money were you making? Um, I mean, you know, I remember on one occasion in a day making uh, nearly fifteen thousand pounds in one day. Uh, that was transacting um, sold like three or four keys of coke to one particular guy and put like two, two and a half grand, three grand on each one. And um, yeah, um, I mean that that was a, that was an, an exceptional, but. I, I suppose I worked out on average it was probably about thirty thousand pounds a month. Okay, and and how how close were you to to getting caught in the UK? Um, because I understand I know that you went you ended up getting caught in the UK and going to prison, but there must have been numerous times where you were very close. Um, I mean, I suppose half the times I probably wouldn't be aware of, but um, I mean, yeah, there were a few occasions. I mean, the problem was. Is it? Is it? Are we talking about before I went to Ecuador? Or, yeah. Or, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you're still in the UK. You're dealing. You're you're importing drugs into the UK and, and and dealing drugs before you you went over to Latin America. Um. Yeah. Well, like I said, I mean, the, the only importation really that I did was the ecstasy that one time, and then after that, um, I I then got arrested in Britain, uh, sometime after, and sent sentenced to five years in prison, uh, which I did two and a half. Or just over two and a half of and then i was released uh came up with the idea of bringing cocaine into the country impregnated in rubber and then putting it into the ground sheets of tents um so that was that that was when the international um importation uh started properly how how did you get um because look it's all it's all connection really in relationships in that world how how you know, you can't just go up to someone you know and say, hey, I want to start importing cocaine into the UK. Let's do it. How did you get connected? Because I'm assuming you got connected to the cartels in Latin America. Yeah, we, yeah, yeah. it was the Cali cartel. Um, yeah, basically the Cali cartel. So that connection came about through, um, I, I mean, I can't mention a name, but it was some old associates, that we, shall I say, um, that I'd been involved with prior to going to prison. And having been sentenced to, the, to that five years in, in the English prisons, I, that, that did put me off uh, drug dealing in Britain. So I decided that if, if and when I got back out and if I did go back to drug dealing, that the only thing I was going to do was start importing cocaine because it was small in volume and high in value. And I didn't particularly want to be buying, for example, buying drugs in London to then distribute throughout the rest of Britain because I was by that point quite well known to the local police and British police. So, you know, I, I knew that they, those days were kind of over. So I decided that the only thing I would do if I went back into trafficking was bring in cocaine uh, direct from whichever source country it came from, 
which in this instance happened to be Colombia. Um, and in order to get those contacts, I, I phoned an old associate and I said, look, because I mean, this is one of the guys I was getting most of my coke off before I went to prison. So obviously he had good contacts for it. So sure. I said, look, have you got any good contacts um, with any Colombians or, you know, Peruvians or whoever that we could source coke from to bring in? And he made a couple of phone calls. And then we went up to London to um, Kennington, I think it was, not Kensington, Kennington. Uh, and um, met up with a Colombian and a Chilean guy. Started buying some coke from them initially um, to sell on, as as a, basically as a way of getting to know them. And on about the second or third deal, I said, "Look, the real reason that I'm here is because I want to start bringing cocaine into the country myself. Um, you know, would you be interested in in teaming up with me? You know, this is what I've got to offer." And I said, I've, "You know, I've, I've got a lot of contacts in Britain for distribution and sales." I can handle the logistics, I can get passengers, you know, I've got various other options open to you. And so, yeah, you know, obviously they were interested and um, they they said, look, we're, we're already actually bringing it into the country and we're bringing it in, in rubber, in the ground sheets of tents. So I was like, well, that's fantastic because I'd heard about this system of impregnating cocaine into plastic or rubber whilst I was in prison in Parkhurst. I'd read about it in the Sunday Times about some guys that had been caught bringing in a container load of uh, plastic patio furniture, white patio furniture that was basically, it was all impregnated with cocaine. And I just thought that was ingenious. So when these Colombian, well, when this Colombian and Chilean told me that that's the system they were using, I was like, yeah, well, that's brilliant because that's exactly the way I had in mind of doing it anyway. So we teamed up and, um, yeah, started bringing in cocaine. Are you not, how, you must have been concerned going to meet this guy because I understand that obviously you had connections from your time in prison in the UK. They'll obviously check to find out who you, you are, who you say you are. But were you not slightly concerned that they might think you're like an undercover police officer or, you know, because no. they're going to be paranoid and, and worried that, they're going to start doing things to implicate themselves or did you just have no fear no no i mean because like i said because it was through an old associate and these 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 um these well the colombian and, and the chilean mainly the colombian had been working with my associate's friend for years you know they were all old sort of networked uh friends shall we say so, so as, as a trafficker then just for my understanding and also anybody else that's outside because i'm sure there's lots of people inside that world or understand it more saying no that's not how it works and maybe this is a silly question but for those that don't know it won't be as a trafficker are you essentially partnering in, in, with the the cartel to bring it over you sell it on and then they get their cut and you get your cut are you actually purchasing no. it from them to bring it into the country yeah. you own you actually own that then yeah, 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 yeah it was the latter so we were we were buying it from uh the cartel in Cali. So we had the, the Colombian had a a sort of family connection in Cali where he was from. So he was using this guy to uh as an intermediary. So he would go and buy the cocaine. They would then impregnate it, put it into the tent. So it was ours from the start. There was no and we 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 would, you know, we made sure he was well looked after. He would get a uh you know an equal slice of the profits. So um, it was basically a, a four-way split when it got back to Britain. Okay. And when you so you bring the you bring the drugs into the country, they're obviously impregnated into rubber um, mm -hmm. and the sheets of the camping gear. What happens then? Because you have to obviously extract it. So did you have labs? Did you have people working yeah, we, for you? That we would try and find a, a location. I mean, I, I tried to find locations outside of the city, but invariably we would end up in the middle of cities in in apartment blocks or, or, or houses. But um, yeah, so we, we'd, we'd set up a small lab, um, makeshift lab that would uh, we would then extract the, the uh, cocaine in using various different chemicals, acids, alcohols. Uh, we would then, normally we would then put about 20, well, 
30 30 percent cut into it repress it and then sell it on i well <clears throat> i would actually hand it to um just one or two people uh and come back in about three or four weeks and get the money or get the money as it was coming in how, how many labs did you have in the uk well i mean we each time we brought something in we would normally set up a different lab we wouldn't we wouldn't do it in the same place uh twice i think it was only one occasion that we did it in, in the same place twice because of the of the fear of it having been found out or anyone having seen something a bit funny reporting it so we were very fluid and mobile um yeah How, what, what was the most amount of cocaine that you were bringing in at one time because i'm assuming it it tends to grow, right? You do it and then you want more, uh, you want more. Well, I mean, it, at the point at which I was arrested, it, we were about to jump up to bring it in, bring it in by a shipping container. So I, I think that's probably the, the, one of the reasons the police took me out when they did. Um, you know, apart from the fact that they, they, they'd obviously built up quite a heavy case by then anyway. But um, yeah, I mean, we started out bringing in, I think the first one was three or four keys. I mean, it was fairly constant because, I mean, you can only fit so much into a tent, uh, you know, the, the floor area of the tent, you know, you, you know, we can't make it really thick. So it was a bit of a very thin layer throughout the whole uh, surface area or floor area. <coughs> so, yeah, it, it was normally between three and five kilos. Okay. And then obviously in the UK, as, as, as this is going on, the police are starting to catch on to you. The Serious Organised Crime Agency are starting yeah. to catch on to you can you remember exactly where you were and how you felt when you found out that a couple of your labs had been raided and it, yeah. it was looking like game over yeah well I, uh i mean when the first one got hit i was actually in colombia in carly itself <laughs> and um in the middle of setting up another deal uh with the guy over there who we used to call commandant because he was uh he was an ex um paramilitary commander big military looking guy so um by, i remember the morning we, we we start ringing back to london to um talk to our, our you know the colombian to say how things are going and whatnot and all the phones are switched off <clears throat> so in immediately we're like oh god what the hell's happened here so uh commandante phones um his family member who's married to the Colombian in London and she says oh god you know the lab got taken out yesterday or like yeah yesterday um they've all been arrested and I think they'd arrested uh like six or seven of them in this lab uh found I think three or four keys of coke loads of precursor chemicals the press all sorts of stuff so you know they'd all been bundled up and taken into custody and i was like oh god here we go and i thought you know i was I, basically i was waiting for my door on the flat i was living in to get smashed down back in britain so i just stayed in colombia waiting to see what would happen waited a few weeks very paranoid time you know had to go into sort of hiding in colombia a little bit uh me and uh, the guy there split up and went in different directions because obviously we didn't want to be seen or caught together so I, I went off to the north of Colombia and stayed with a friend up there, uh, had a little holiday <laughs> and nothing happened uh, as far as I was concerned back in Britain. So I, I took a flight back and, and landed and came through, uh, not carrying anything, but I came through, okay, didn't get stopped or questioned. And so things seemed to be okay. I seemed to be in the clear. So when when we started, we had an agreement, me, the Colombian and Chilean, who set it up initially, that if anyone was left, well, if, if a lab or, or any of us got arrested, whoever was left had to look after the other members' families, mm -hmm. um, yeah, which is what I did. So we carried on trafficking. Uh, the Colombian managed to get access to a telephone in the prison. Um, so I would, I was, paying his his uh girlfriend and family's bills rent you know everything all the all yep. the electricity food whole lot um you know i'd send money into him in prison and make sure he had credit for the telephone um, the mobile telephone that he had access to so 
um, yeah, um, a couple of other people were bringing things in at the same time, um, but wouldn't have chemists. So they would contact me through the Colombian and say, you know, and I would then go and collect their jobs as well, extract that and then sell it for them and, and, and give them a percentage back. So we weren't only doing our jobs, we were also uh, taking on jobs from other people um, as they came up, if they needed things extracted or whatnot. So, because obviously we could get it fairly cheap. Yeah. So what was it, what was it that made you, because you ended up fleeing the country, right? So what, what happened yeah. that made you end up fleeing the country? And also, how did you flee the country? Yeah, well, I mean, what after that first lab got busted and the Colombian was in prison and the Chilean were in prison, um, the, the Colombian got released after six months. And I, I, I mean, from the day that they got busted, I was uh, already feeling pretty paranoid and, and you know, uh, watching my back. So when he got released after six months, obviously well, well, I was fairly suspicious and so were other people with me. And... I quickly realized that he he was acting as an informant. I mean, I wasn't 100% certain, but all the telltale signs were there. And I, um, I, was a, I made a contact with an Asian guy from somewhere near London to do with something else, some fraud that he was involved with. And he checked me out because um, he said that he wouldn't work with anyone unless he'd had a thorough background check done. And he had someone on the inside of the police force in the Met who came back to him very quickly and warned him, look, this guy, i.e. me, was red hot and there was a big investigation into me for drug trafficking. And he didn't know anything about me drug trafficking. So I knew this was genuine. And, I, yeah. and I, to, to make sure it was genuine, I said to him, well, look, prove me that this is genuine and I'll pay for, for information for, you know, so, so that I know what's going on, so for like the surveillance notes and stuff like this. So he started giving us um, some of the, some of the surveillance notes from the police investigation, and it tallied up with where I'd been or where other people in the case had been at certain times, married up to the information he was presenting me. So I knew it was genuine information. So I started paying him, so we knew that the police were onto us. And I, 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 you, we could see that they were anyway, because we saw the surveillance teams, you know, every now and then. So it became very much a game of cat and mouse, um, which lasted up until the lab. We, we'd set up a lab in Edinburgh. Uh, and that was the, the final one to get busted. And that got raided uh, one, I can't remember the date, but it was at night, 10.30 p.m. We again spotted the surveillance on the flat, and there were two Colombians working in there, a man and a woman. And they said, Look, um, Peter, because I was out at the time, they said, Look, we, we've spotted a car at the back of the, uh, of the flat. This is down in Leith area of Edinburgh. Mm -hmm. We think that the police are monitoring the flat. So I came back, came up into the flat, and sort of looked out the back window down in just around the corner from Leith police station. <laughs> I looked out the window down onto the back of this where the street was and uh sure enough there were two people looking up at the flat obviously police officers so i actually went out of the flat jumped in the transit van i was driving and they moved from where they were surveilling the flat to a car park just across the road and i've seen them do this so what so i've i've blocked them into the car park so they can't get out of the car park. And I could see them in the car talking to each other, thinking, what the fuck are we going to do? So I sat there for a minute, sort of making it obvious that I knew they were there. Then I let them out. And I actually followed them through Edinburgh for about 10 or 15 minutes up into a, uh, a set of traffic lights down on um, the links, I think it was, or, the, or that sort of dual carriageway that runs out along towards Portobello. And then we, you know, I, I let them go a different direction. And I tailed off back to the flat parked the van outside the flat on Wellington Place uh, by the park there. There's a taxi taxi uh, rank office and a gym. So I went up into the flat briefly and said, look, to the Columbus, I said, look, this is, we're obviously on top. You know, if you want me to get you out of here, I'll get you out of here, but I'm not staying any fucking way, so I'm gone. So they said, no, 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 we're not sure. It's the police. I said, oh, no, I'm telling you 100% that was the police, undoubtedly. So it's either we go now or, you know, 
it's, you're on your own. So they wanted to stay, and I and I went, okay, I'm gone. So I went off, went into the Balmoral Hotel, left the transit van outside the flat, got a taxi from there. The police must have thought I was still in the flat because the van was there. Mm-hmm. Raided the flat at 10.30 p.m. at night, found the Colombian, found some drugs, found the chemicals, the press, everything. Took them something like half an hour to smash the door down because it was a big solid oak door on one of these merchants' flats. So it took them about half an hour apparently to get through this door. Huge operation, uh, and that hit the headlines. Um, I remember waking up the following morning. I didn't know this had happened, and again, go to ring the the Columbia. All the phones are off. I'm like, oh god, not again. <laughs> so I drive back down to the flat around. I don't know, 11 o'clock in the morning. And I, you know, I drive around the block. It's all quiet. I can't see any police. And decide, you know, I'll take a chance and go up and see if everything's okay. Get to the top of the stairs and the door's all boarded up. Obviously, they changed the lock. So I've just got up there really quickly. Um, I stayed around in Edinburgh for a couple of days uh, on the lowdown to to clear a few things up with like, uh, yeah someone <laughs> and then uh disappeared back down to england uh knew that the police would be on my tail pretty soon i actually phoned the police in edinburgh when i once i was back in england and i said look you know i know i know you know who i am i know you that you just raided the flat there uh, my sister had been staying there at the time so i just wanted to clear her so they asked for her to go in for questioning, which she did. Obviously, she was in the clear because she had nothing to do with it. Mm-hmm. They, they half threatened her on the phone to me. They said, oh, well, it, it would be a shame if your sister was involved in this. And I said, well, look, you know she's not. So don't even go down that road, um, which they didn't, which I'm thankful for because, you know, she was obviously completely innocent. Um, uh she she was away at the time that this happened um so the police got and asked me to come back home for questioning and i said well look i'm down in england at the moment i'm a little bit busy and i'm not sure when i'll be back uh, to scotland probably not as hard anytime soon so i hung around in england for a little bit because i knew it would take a while for the forensic evidence to come back i fingerprints and all this sort of stuff uh so waited a little bit and I knew it was getting close. So I, I got smuggled out of the country by the Turkish mafia um, through uh, Dover out in, into France and then just disappeared, basically dropped all my electronic communications, closed all my bank accounts, cleared them out, just you know stopped using anything electronic um, that, that was connected to me previously and uh yeah disappeared for a bit and then decided to do one last fateful job um which is when i went out to ecuador and the colombian being an informant uh had obviously told the police in britain you know he's doing this one last job and then he's going to be he's going to be in the wind because on my plan had been to go to ecuador oversee the tent being handed to the passenger who was coming from britain and then I was going back to France, get a change of luggage, go out to Thailand, wait in Thailand for the money to be sent to me and spend six months to a year there, just wait for it all to calm down and cool off. But I never made it back and got arrested in Ecuador uh, in the penthouse of a hotel on Avenue Amazonas in Quito with what they alleged was just under eight, eight kilograms of cocaine in the tent. And my girlfriend at the time, even worse, had come out for a holiday because I hadn't seen her for a while. So I said, look, why don't you come out to Ecuador? Because it's far away from any trouble in Britain and Europe. Come out to Ecuador where you'll be safe and have a holiday with me. Um, whilst I just did oversee a little bit of business, she didn't really know what was going on. And um, she got arrested on the first day, uh, like four hours after she arrived. <laughs> so she wasn't best pleased. Wow. So you, you, I want to go back a little bit to you yeah. being smuggled out the country. <laughs> so you have connections with the Cali cartel. You have connections yeah. with local gangs and everything else, because of course you do for distribution. Like that. 
and you have connections with the Turkish mafia. Yeah. You must have at some point been connected and working with some of the most dangerous people on this planet. Yeah, I mean, excluding I, governments. I mean, when I, when I was first arrested in in Britain uh, back in two thousand, um, the pol- the the police. I mean, that they put me down as potential category A prisoner. I mean, I was I was category A to begin with for about the first six months, which was an absolute nightmare. I was being held in a prison that wasn't category A. Um, I was the only potential category A prisoner in the whole prison. This is a Gloucester prison. And they, the police and the guards kept saying to me, oh, we know you're connected to the Adams family up in London. They were like, well, well, at the time, one of Britain's biggest crime families. And I was like, not that I'm aware of that. I'm, you know, I'm not. And as far as I was concerned, I wasn't. But I think inadvertently I had been because I'd been collecting cocaine from the Islington area of London. Whether or not I was, I don't know. Uh, they never proved anything. But um, yeah, I mean, you know, I've, um, after being arrested in Ecuador, uh, they actually um, half alleged that I was connected to Al-Qaeda, some, some members um, of Al-Qaeda through my Asian contact. The, um, I'm just trying to remember exactly what happened. Basically, I'd inadvertently, through Asian friends, come into contact with four different people who were uh, who were directly contacted to members of Al Qaeda and ISIS, uh, unbeknown to me. And when the second London bombing. Uh, was attempted and you remember they, they the bombers didn't detonate you remember they were trying to blow up the the, the yep. underground i was in france on the run at that point and i i had a mule coming through london and i said to him in a message or something just be careful today in london because this i think there's something going on because my friend had spotted surveillance in london and we didn't realize or we we didn't know that actually it was um, an attempted uh, suicide bombing that was going on. So when the police intercepted this this message, they they later said to me, how did you possibly know that that bombing was about to happen? Uh, Because, look, here's the message. You saying there's something happening today because obviously my friend was carrying a bag. Be careful going through London. And they thought I was inadvertently funding terrorism. (laughs) Wow. and I'd like to say I never would and never have done. That's insane. So, uh, but I'll, during... I'll, from their point of view, uh, you know, when, you know, I mean, if you're looking at me and, you know, like you say, you see that I'm linked to the Turkish and linked to various different Asian people who have, uh, have got uh, friends who are, or family members who are linked. I mean, one or two might be chance, but four, you know, even I'd start thinking, well, that, you know, there's something going on here. Yeah, yeah. I don't know you mean of Mozambique, who was arrested and he, he spent two years in Guantanamo Bay. When I was what, in Quito, What was the name, sorry? Mozambique. Okay. He, um, he went on to um, establish a charity in London called, I can't remember the name of it now, but it's to do with Muslim... Uh, Muslims and stuff. I can't, um, yeah, I'll have to look it up. But um, I, I was asleep one day in, in Quito in prison, and we had CNN on in, in the background. And uh, this news article came up about this guy who'd been arrested, and his, he was from Birmingham with the name Vague. And I suddenly sat up, sat up in bed, and I went, hold on a minute. That's, I've got a very good friend from, from near Birmingham with that family name. And obviously this question of terrorism had come up in my papers by this point. So I rang my friend up and I said, please don't tell me that you're connected to this guy. And he said, yeah, that's my cousin. And I went, well, that explains a few things now, you know. Yeah. So you can see yeah. how they might think that. When you're trafficking that amount, that amount of drugs, you're involved with some serious individuals. And... You're, whether you're on the run or not on the run what what is your day-to-day like when you're not working can you enjoy 
your day? Can you relax? Can you? Yeah, it was actually because we would we would do say on on average maybe one tent a month or something like that. So once once it got up and running, the system we you know I when when we got it back and it was processed out, like I said earlier, I I've literally take the whole lot to either one or either just one or two people give it to them and i wouldn't see them again for like a few weeks wouldn't even have to contact them they would just i we had that much trust they would just ring me when they had all the money together and, and i'd go and collect the money so i you know wouldn't really have to do anything in in the time in between but so, you're not riddled with anxiety though no but i mean as long as i didn't have anything around me i felt quite comfortable you know Okay. okay. Like I said, I mean, we knew that the police were surveilling us, so you know, we would talk on phones. We wouldn't talk in a house. We wouldn't talk in a car. No confined in space, confined enclosed spaces. Um, I mean, to that, I suppose to that uh, degree, I was, I was very paranoid in that way. Um, but uh, otherwise, no, not really. So you've fled to Ecuador um got the arrested no you've you've ended up going over to ecuador oh, after french yeah, right yeah, yeah. and you've been arrested there's i need to word this safely there's regular allegations of corruption over there you know okay. many people have said it in the past um did you ever use the corruption of officials and senior people within the country to reduce your sentence yeah definitely <laughs> as soon as i got arrested i was trying to go trying to bribe people <laughs> i mean the british wow. police and said we know they actually sat down across the table from me because they were collecting evidence and said we know you're trying to bribe the the ecuadorian authorities um and they said look because they were talking about extraditing me uh, at the beginning and they said to me, they said, if you get sentenced to less than 10 years or serve less than six in prison, when you complete this sentence, we will then extradite you back to Britain, where we will resentence you and we'll start the sentencing at 20 on a guilty plea. And, you know, obviously I was going to go not guilty anyway. So um, you can imagine the sentence would have been 25 plus. So throughout the whole time, Throughout the whole time I was in Ecuador, which was over nine years, at the back of my mind every day was the fear. Oops, sorry, I've just knocked the camera. Hold on. Okay. Was the fear that um, on my return to England I was going to be resentenced um, to, you know, another twenty years or something. And uh, when it came to bribing the judge in Ecuador, I I actually had to tell my solicitor, please tell the judge not to sentence me to less than 10 years. Um, because if, if I get less than 10 years, I'm going to end up back in trouble in England. So, I mean, can you imagine having to ask for no less than 10 years? And to pay for the privilege of that, oh, God, <laughs> that sentence. And um, I mean, at the time, the sentence, the maximum sentence in Ecuador was 25 years for drug trafficking. And the British police had uh, had requested that I be sentenced to 25 years out there. I'd seen the paperwork, the, the like the petition from the British police to the Ecuadorian government and police force asking for me to be sentenced to 25 years. And at that very time, there was no remission in sentences. I think they were giving you it was something stupid like a month. That was it. They, they were giving you a month off every year you served. So if I'd have had to do 25, I would have done 23 out of 25. And I remember when I got the paper, I actually, my friends told me I turned white. And I actually felt dizzy. That's the first time I've ever had that happen, where, you know, being told that you might get a sentence of 25 years in an Ecuadorian prison. I, you know, I, I felt faint, physically faint. I want to ask about your... First, because you'd obviously been to prison in the UK, um, and I know that prisons are different over there. Um, was the was your first day of prison in Ecuador the scariest, or were there scarier experiences after that? And if so, what were they? Uh, <laughs> <coughs> um, now, the first day in prison in Ecuador wasn't the scariest, definitely not, because um, when I was arrested, 
uh, and taken into the Interpol police holding cells, which are near the airport in Quito. Um, I met up with some some Syrian and Lebanese guys who were there for terrorism as well, but spoke English, quite nice guys. Uh, they'd been trafficking drugs back to the, uh, the, the Middle East, selling the, the cocaine and then buying arms and explosives, uh, you know, to aid their cause. So they sort of took me under their wing and they had a lot of influence there. Uh, one of their members was uh, the boss of the wing for the foreigners in, in the prison. So I was immediately sort of protected being with them. Um, so going into the prison wasn't that bad, to be honest. Um, I mean, I, as far as scary instances go, I mean, the, I think one of the most frightening was the, the gun battle. In the second prison that I was in, um, there was a gun fight uh, on the wing one night, started at about, about 9.30 p.m. between two rival gangs, the Chineros and the, uh, what was the Cubanos at the time, for control of the prison. And the, the Cubanos had tried to take out the, the boss of the Chineros who was on our wing. And it started when I took a plate of food to his his like right hand man who was living in the cell next door to the boss. So I've handed him this plate of spaghetti bolognese and over my shoulder, uh, one of the other gang members has used me as sort of cover, unbeknownst to me, come up over this shoulder, shot from behind me, shot the guy straight in the face, blew the back of his head out and uh, killed him, obviously, uh, instantly. So I- this is, this is the guy you're handing the plate of food to? Yeah, yeah, it gets to, gets shot straight in the face, blows the back of his head out. So he's right in front of you when this happens. Yeah. I'm literally handing him the plate of food and the shots have come past my head from behind me and hit him in the face to go back of his head out and kill him instantly. So obviously I ran to myself <laughs> as far as I could. And uh, there was a German guy in the cell with me at the time, also called Peter. And I've shut the door and he's reopened the door to have a look and see what's going on. <laughs> and I've, I've had to drag him back in, slam the door, lock it. And a two hour gun battle ensued with two of the Choneros, uh, one of whom was called Raskina or Hot, uh, JL, Hotter Ellie, uh, who was the boss, and another guy called Manuko. And against about 12 or 14 of the Cubanos uh two people were shot dead well including the guy that was shot in front of me another guy from the other side was killed as well uh so there were two dead and about 12 injured some of that nine it was either nine or 12 injured gun yeah gun battle that lasted two hours that was terrifying and uh, i guess the prison over there is different right because you can pretty much while it's more dangerous yeah. There's less control over your freedom within the prison, right? You can pretty much get your hands on anything you want. As you said, you were watching CNN. Yeah. Yeah, it's... yeah I mean, yeah, because of the corruption. I mean, I mean, it, uh, and it's still like that to this day. They did try and clean it up a bit. They built a whole new prison estate. Uh, and it stops the trouble for about two or three months, I suppose. But going back to how dangerous it is, that literally a month ago, there was a riot in Ecuador, in which two people that I knew were beheaded. Um, one guy that was on the wing there, he called Marino, uh, yeah, was killed and beheaded. And I was sent the photographs of his beheaded head, which I think I shared with you. I don't, you didn't look at them, yeah. did you? Uh, but, no, I can't. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they, yeah, it was, I it just was received them, but they were not looked at. <laughs> yeah, the best um, not because they were horrific. There were 80 people killed. They were dismembering people, beheading them, disemboweling them. People were shot, stabs. I mean, you know, and I, I've witnessed stuff like that firsthand. Uh, I mean, I've, I've, I've mentioned this before. That I've, I've witnessed every kind, virtually every kind of death that you can imagine, from people being shot to stabbed, drowned, electru electrocuted, uh, hung, uh, choked, beaten to death, head crushed with a rock. I mean, just everything. Just Does anybody... Everything. Has anyone ever tried to kill you? Uh, uh, yeah, 
<laughs> I mean, the, the, I would say, um, yeah, I suppose so, yeah. There have been people that have wanted to kill me, yeah, but they haven't managed, obviously, because I wouldn't be talking to you. Uh, I mean, in Ecuador, I was lucky as insofar as, yeah, I, I don't, I mean, I don't think I ever came in for any very serious threats. Uh, just trying to think. I mean, there were a couple of instances where it got a bit tense and I thought I was maybe not going to make it out. So I'm assuming given some of the business deals that, that you've been involved in, some of the people you've been around and also in prison, I mean, you must you must have at some point been on the wrong side of a gun. Yeah. Yeah. I, in fact, I, um, I'm just writing my, my, my second book at the moment, the pre-card to my first book, which is Ellen Piano. And in it, I, I literally just wrote a chapter... Um, yeah um uh, well I, I told the story within a chapter so this was when i where before i got arrested in england i'd gone down to london uh to buy half a kilo of coke from a fairly new contact so i was quite paranoid anyway going down and i had fourteen thousand pounds cash with me to buy buy it it was twenty eight thousand pounds a kilo at the time and I uh, got down to Chiswick and the car, the hire car that I was driving had a slow puncture. So I decided to pull off the Chiswick High Road into one of the lanes that runs parallel to it. So I parked up. I said to the guy, look, I'm parked up in this lane. Come on your own. Don't want to see anyone else with you. So he turns up with somebody else driving him. So immediately there's somebody else there. So I'm like, oh, fuck, what's going on here? And I've got a flat tire now. And there's no spare in the car. So I'm waiting for the AA or RSC or whoever the cover was with to come out. I've already phoned them. So the guy that I had the contact with gets in the car with the half key of Coke, shows it to me. And immediately I noticed it's the same Coke that I'm getting from somebody else on the other side of London in Erith, my usual supply. And, um, you know, I mentioned this, I say, you know, this is, this is the same Coke I'm already getting. As I'm saying it, my my because i'm obviously facing into the car my door my driver's side door gets opened and there's a gun stuck in my face a two-shot derringer you know the little uh, hand size two-shot derringers so that's in my face now and i can see the guy's nervous probably coked up his hands shaking and that's the worst because if you've got yeah. somebody yeah. nervous with a gun on you they only have to squeeze the trigger a little bit you're dead so you know, for the sake of 14 grand, which I'm pretty sure I'm going to be able to get back because I, I know where this coke is coming from. So it must be the same people that are supplying this guy that are supplying me because I, I know they're the top people in London. So I say, look, take the money. I'm not getting shot for 14 grand. So, you know, obviously they quickly take the money and they're off. Somebody walking past has seen this. And as they disappear, I'm sat there like a bit stunned and a bit shocked. Suddenly, the police descend upon me as well. <laughs> All like, you know, armed police and fucking cars screaming up from everywhere. And uh, they, you know, they say, oh, we had reports that, of, a, of, a, of a robbery going on. And I said, oh, yeah, yeah, some, and, you know, I, was, I lied. I said, oh, yeah, some black guys, you know, no, no offence to anyone watching. You know, I'm not racist in any way, shape or form. I said, oh, you know, some black guys that just pulled a gun on me and robbed my wallet. So obviously, I didn't want to say what I was doing there. So, you know, they, they I said, look, I, I said, well, what are we doing here? I said, well, I, I had a flat tyre, so I didn't want to park on the main uh, Chiswick High Road. So I pulled off into this lane to wait for the AA to turn up. So they've checked the car and they've seen the flat tyre. And oh, I can see they're not really believing me. <laughs> so they say, OK, we let us take you into custody, like protective custody, considering you've just been robbed at gunpoint. So, uh, you know, they take me in, the AA turn up, and uh, these guys, uh, I, I didn't realise that this, these guys, as they robbed me, they've also, as they're leaving, they punctured two more tyres on the car to be oh. sure I'm after them. So now the car's got, like, three flat tyres, so the AA can't do anything about it. So I end up getting relayed all the way home, minus my 14 grand. <laughs> but phone the people... When I got back home, I phoned the people in the era and I said, look, you know, I've just been robbed by, uh, mentioned the guy's name that robbed me. 
do you know them? Because they have the same cocaine as I'm getting from you. So they must be getting from the same people. So my guy said, let me check. He rang the, the Colombian who unbelievably all these years later turned out to be the same Colombian that I ended up doing business with in Ecuador. Get that. <laughs> anyway, obviously, obviously this is, I, you know, this is rewinded the clock now. So he rings this Colombian and they knew the people that had robbed me. So I said to them, because I owed them money anyway, I said, look, you're going to have to go and collect the money that I owe you from these guys because they've just robbed their own people, basically. So they owned and they are, and they said, well, that's not... And I said, well, look, there's nothing I can do about it. I haven't got your money now. I've just been robbed by your people, so they've just robbed you. So you're going to have to go and collect your money from them. You know them, collect it. So that's what happened, and that was the last I heard of it. Wow. Luckily. So... But that's so quite when... scary. Uh, yeah, I wouldn't like to experience that one myself. Um, with regards to your your experience in the the prison, and like one of the things that I've noticed from researching you and looking online and things is you're obviously still friends and have a lot of of you know uh, contacts with people who, from my research, you've probably spent time with and are now out, and looks like they are trying to turn their life around as well. Um, do you find that? your previous life still follows you today and it can uh, you know it must make it difficult for things for you yeah, to kind definitely. of get on you know with a, with a, you know with a criminal history like i have i mean trying to get a job is virtually impossible um so you know i'm trying to start my own businesses which again is equally difficult because i mean you know i would like to start an importation business everybody laughs as soon as i say it but i would importing fruit and I would like to start a, a chocolate uh, chocolate business growing cacao in Ecuador, where it's some of the best chocolate in the world. I would like to buy the land there myself, grow the cacao and produce my own chocolate, my own range of chocolate products. You know, powder, chocolate powder, chocolate bars, all of it. But, you know, as soon as I mention this or try and get, I mean, I've started uh, a couple of businesses uh, with a view to importing things, but as soon as I try and apply for licenses, HMRC, Customs and Excise, just kind of goes, no fucking way, we're going to give you a license. So, it, you know, unfortunately, it does follow you through the rest of your life. So for anybody that's thinking about becoming involved in drug trafficking, I would advise you not to because, A, it will ruin your life. Uh, that's if you survive to spend the money that you make because you're likely to get killed either by another gang or being robbed, or if you end up in prison, certainly abroad, you'll be lucky to survive it there. Um, you know, the fact that I went through nine years of prison in Ecuador was a miracle because, I mean, loads of my friends were killed out there, English and a Scottish guy, Ronnie Walker from Edinburgh, uh, R.I. Peter Ronnie. Um, he got killed by uh, some corrupt police officers and the gang members in the prison. I don't know exactly why, but um, he, they killed him and then hung him up and pretended it was a suicide. It was quite apparent that it wasn't because the um, English guy, uh, Stephen Tool, he was also, he was one of my best friends over there. He, he was, uh, he'd done nine years at the point he was killed. And he tried to do some business and make some money to try and get out of prison, which I advised him not to. Got into debt with a gang out there, a debt of about $150,000. And they gave him until a certain date to pay the money or they were going to kill him. And we found him hung in his cell. Quite obviously, he hadn't hung himself by the way the knot was tied and his head was touching the ceiling. There was no, no drop on the rope and there was no nothing for him to have stood on to get himself up there, if you see what I mean. Yeah, yeah. It's a, a very apparent not suicide. So, yeah, my advice to anyone who's thinking about drug trafficking is, is don't do it. It's not worth it. It will disrupt your, well, it, just ruin your life, basically. And all your family around you, you know, putting them through you being in prison and all the, all the, the fear and paranoia is just an absolute death sentence or life sentence. Yeah, I would just say it's not worth it. 
Did you not estimate once that over 50% of the friends that you had in that life are now dead? Uh, probably. I mean, I've stopped counting the number of people that have died around me. Uh, uh, from a very young age, people started dying around me. Uh, my best friend died when I was 14, not from drugs. But um, I've had a weird thing all throughout my life. Uh, death has followed me. My stepbrother and his cousin killed themselves in the month of November. Uh, I was the last person to see my stepbrother alive. Um, I've had three girlfriends killed in car accidents and, and various other things. Um, I mean, just an inordinate number of people have died around me. I, by the time I was 20 or 21, I've seen eight people actually pass away in front of me, take their last breaths from drug overdoses, heart attacks and car accidents. Do you yeah. feel like that that almost helped prepare you in a way for the barbaric violence that you would experience Probably. being involved in the drug trade? Probably. I mean, I've been always been very calm and depression, things like that. Uh, you know, if I see a car accident or someone dying, I will try and help or save them. Um, I will, yeah, I mean, I actually applied to be a, well, nearly applied to be a paramedic years ago with the Avon and Somerset Ambulance Service. Um, but um, yeah, I couldn't because of a speeding ticket that came through the day I was going to send off my application. Wow. Did you... Did you, I heard that you tried to escape from prison in Ecuador. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we did. I did. <laughs> so yeah. how, how, how were you planning to escape? Uh, the, the one that, the, 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 I suppose the best attempt that we made was uh, in Quito, where we tried to dig a tunnel out of the prison. <laughs> um, the prison, which is called Garcia Moreno prison, uh, was a very old building like i think it was built in the 1850s or something like that so very much around the victorian style of english prisons you know with a center and then all the wings coming off it like spokes on a on a tire on a, on a wheel um so i bought a, a a cell on the ground floor on the on b wing which was mainly the ecuadorian wing uh did this with some colombian friends and they put some people in the cell to dig the tunnel so started digging the tunnel and unfortunately someone told the guards that we were trying to escape they never found the tunnel whilst i was in that prison but um they knew that we were trying to escape so i i got suddenly transferred out of quito after after having been there for two years uh they came and got me one day and said yeah you're you're, you're out of here you're being transferred to guayaquil which was the really dangerous prison that i that i ended up in where I did the rest of my time, another seven years. So um, after a little while, after a while of being in Guayaquil, having been transferred, there was a news bulletin came up one night and they, they'd they been digging a, a, a sort of access road around the perimeter of the prison, just outside the wall. And they came across the tunnel that we'd been digging. <laughs> And we'd actually make we we knew that we did that we'd made it just out underneath the wall, but we hadn't had time to come up. Yeah, yeah. By the time we that we got transferred because the the guards got wind that we were going to take out. Because I mean, I was I was adamant that I was going to take as many people out of the prison that, that I could. So they classed it as a fuga massiva, which is massive escape, uh, and said that I was planning to take out upwards of sixteen or seventeen people with me, which I would have done <laughs> had I had my way. But we, we, we planned all sorts of escapes from anything from a helicopter lift off the roof through to the Colombians that I was friends with were ex-members of FARC, the mm -hmm. uh, the um, guerrilla group, uh, Colombian guerrilla group. Well, they call them terrorists. I don't know. Are they? Aren't they? Who knows? Anyway, they had suggested um, blowing the exercise, the, the wall of the exercise yard with an RPG rocket propelled grenade launcher and laying down cover fire because of a gun turrets around the around the perimeter of the prison so we would lay lay down covering fire to put off the guards and then blow the wall of the, of the exercise yard and then just all escape that was that we very nearly did that one we were seriously thinking about that given Obviously, with the friends you had, you were obviously in a certain place of influence. Um, we haven't touched on the fact that you ended up bringing cocaine into the prison as well. So you were obviously in a position of power in, in, to some regard. 
have you ever had to pick up a firearm to defend yourself? <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah, we we had our own gun in in the prison in, in Quito. I shared it with the Colombians, so we we had a, a revolver um, that we kept on hand, hidden. But you know, for for times when there was a uh, when there was a what they used to call a strike, or I suppose you would call it a mutiny, a prison riot, um, we would get the handgun out just for self protection more than anything. Um, I mean, I remember there was one occasion where a Colombian was killed in, by some Ecuadorians in the, the exercise yard. He was shot. So we quickly responded in kind and killed uh, two of theirs, I think, within the same hour. Within an hour of the Colombian being killed, two of theirs had been shot dead as, as, a, as, a, as a response from us to say, you know, back off, basically. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When you think back to that specific encounter and what you've just shared, how does it kind of make you feel now being on the outside, straightening your life, trying to get by, thinking back to a murder and a retaliation murder with a group that you were essentially involved in? Well, I don't, I don't know. It's just one of those things that had to be done. So. Well, I don't suppose it. Well, yeah, it did have to be done. So, is that one of the problems of the, the war on drugs and the fact that it's essentially just bringing a gun to an, you know, a gun to a gun fight that ultimately doesn't stop the the, the, war, the drugs the war, coming? It's a fallacy. Every, I mean, every anybody who's anybody knows that it's complete fallacy. The, the Americans dreamt up because it's a never-ending war, so therefore they've got never-ending finance for it. So basically, if you, if they if they have anything that has war, the word war connected to it, they they have unlimited access to funds. That's yeah. why they should have war on drugs because it, it just opens up the checkbook to uh, unlimited military spending on firearms and all sorts of stuff. It's yeah, hard. yeah. Do, but, um, so do you believe the legalization and regulation yeah, of drugs? I, is I mean, I, I, I'm strongly in favor of legalization. It's the only way that they're gonna get the problem under control is is manufacture the, the drugs under license as as any other pharmaceutical and sell it under license um with heavy taxation uh to offset any um you know to offset the ill effects and because obviously there will be a a, a cost um as yeah. with smoking tobacco or alcohol there's a there's a detrimental cost to society yeah, as there would be or as there is with drugs but it's far greater at the moment with it being illegal and it, if you do this maths the, the the thing is you look at how many jobs that at the moment are, are created with it being illegal in the in so far as the police the judiciary the prison service and all the things all the ancillary things that make up the prison service and the police also you know things like food for the prisons the electricity everything it's a huge business putting people in prison all the way from the, when they get arrested to everything to the probation service you know all these people that are getting jobs and they're all being paid a wage if it was all if it but these drugs were legalized yeah i suppose that the focus would shift slightly but i i bet you any money it would cost less ultimately than it does now and i think half the reason that it's still illegal is because of the amount of jobs that it supports and yeah. the, and you know i believe it would certainly cost less in the cost of lives by legalizing it you're going to lose less lives by legalizing it i, I said well, I just with the violence alone it's uh well it takes away it takes away the, the criminal element doesn't it if it's done correctly you know yeah absolutely one question that uh I am very interested to ask you is you ended up being transferred back to the UK where you, you spent a few months in, in a UK prison before eventually being released. And, you know, you've walked away from that life. How do you simply cut ties with, with the Cali cartel and your connections and say, I don't want to do this anymore without well, I mean, there being yeah, some I mean, repercussion? That was, that was, I mean, that was always up to me. I mean, I, at the time when I, when we were doing it, I know that was one of the reasons that I didn't really walk away from it because of the amount of people involved. And also I knew 
that I was already in trouble because of the because of what happened in Edinburgh. I was already on the run. So in my eyes, I just thought, well, I might as well keep going because I know I'm going to be arrested sooner or later somewhere because mm-hmm. of the case in, in back in Britain. So, you know, I was already toast, so to speak. So I thought I might as well just carry on anyway. You know, a lot of people ask me, well, why didn't you stop? And that's the reason, because I was already in trouble. And I thought I might as well make the, you know, make hay while the sun shines. <laughs> one of one of the things that I I hear a lot from people who are involved in that world is that you cannot simply walk away from it. And there are cases, of course, there's cases yeah. where people have walked away from the mafia and survived, or walked away from cartels and survived. Um, but surely, in your experience, simply just being transferred back to the UK and being released, and that's it. Surely, it's not that straightforward. Just walking away from the cartel and drug trafficking. Yeah. Well, it was for me because, I mean, like I said at the beginning, we were just buying it from them. We weren't necessarily directly, we weren't locked into them, if you see what I mean. So you're essentially a customer that's no longer interested yeah. in buying. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, so you you do have your 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 first book out, um, which I believe is uh, all about your experience and story of, of your time in prison in Ecuador. Um and, and experiences. So what we'll do is we'll put a link in the description to for anybody that's interested in reading that. So it's a fascinating book. Um, you do need to go into that book understanding that you're reading a book about a very violent prison in Ecuador. And, you know, it's it's uh, it's very educational in that sense and how things work. Um, is there anything else that you're doing now that you want to talk about or, 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 um, or yeah. share, Peter? Um, I, I, in fact, just two days ago, I spoke to somebody at Gloucestershire University in the criminology department. So I will hopefully soon be doing talks for university students um, to well, just, yeah, about my, my experiences in, in order to aid their studies. Um, I'm also going into schools, doing talks for students who are permanently excluded from mainstream education. Uh, because of links to gang or, or or problems with crime, you know. Uh, so I'm, I have, I have, I've already done a few talks for them, but I'm going to be carrying on. And you know, if anybody's interested in me coming in to do a talk for them, then I'd be more than happy to do that. Uh, it's something that I'd like to do more of, really. Wouldn't mind going into prisons to do talks as well. Um, I'm also writing my my the prequel to the first book, uh, which I hope to get out. It's taken me a while to do it, but I'm hoping to get it released next year, published next year. Um, uh, yeah, and just yeah, forming my Perfect. own company and whatnot, and hopefully Fantastic. soon. <laughs> uh, absolutely. Um, if 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 your story doesn't get made into some uh, TV show series, something like that to really that, that, really go that, through that it would be, yeah the best option for me certainly would be for someone like netflix to pick up uh, pick it up and make a series that would be the uh, the optimum i think well i think it has everything in there that uh, makes up a good tv show uh, <laughs> in- including the drama and the violence involved but look i'd like to thank you again for taking the time to share uh, some of your story and and experiences of, of being involved um uh, and sharing it with me and everyone who watches the sit down and i wish okay. you the very best of the future great thanks michael i'll speak to All you right. soon speak to you soon bye bye